Okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you, Russ, uh, read your bio here, and we'll let a few more people filter in. So um, good evening, everyone. I'm Ken Owen, Executive Director of Channel Islands Restoration, and welcome to our periodic webinar series, the Environmental Expert Webinar Series, uh, where we... Um, talk to environmental experts, interestingly enough, uh, mostly to do with the Channel Islands, but not exclusively. And it's been a few months since we've had one of these. Uh, but tonight we have Russ Bradley, who's director of the Santa Rosa Island Research Station. Uh, Russ uh, has grown up loving the islands, the ocean and education and conservation. And he's originally from Vancouver Island, in uh, British Columbia, Canada. So uh, he is an island guy from the beginning. Uh, his passion is for marine science and conservation it was solidified after having a transformational undergraduate semester of what would be his first uh, experience at a remote research station off the west coast of Vancouver Island. After uh, graduating with his bachelor's in biological science from Simon Fraser University outside of Vancouver and doing some tropical and not so tropical <laughs> Pacific field work, Russ uh, returned to Simon Fraser to complete his master's in wildlife ecology. Uh, upon completion, he began uh, what would become a 17-year long tenure with the Farallon Islands uh, program of Blue Point Conservation Science as a biological biologist and program leader. During this time, he went on to publish over 50 uh, peer-reviewed research papers and, and articles. Uh, ranging from seabird ecology and habitat restoration to climate change and resource management. He's uh, worked with uh, many different species from plants to insects and intertidal invertebrates. Let's see, how many are there? Along with salamanders, fish, birds, seals, sea lions, whales, and white sharks. Pretty cool. Yeah, a lot of white sharks out in the Farallons, huh, Russ? Uh, this all prepared him to uh, really, as he says, juggle the balls of the Santa Rosa Island Research Station. He's held this uh, position since August of 2018, uh, leading up uh, program administration, research, education, and liaisoning between uh, many partner agencies like the National Park Service. Uh, this is his dream job, as he describes it, and uh, it helps bring uh, the same transformational remote research station experience uh, Russ has had as, a, uh, had as an undergraduate to CSU Channel Islands. Uh, he's excited to be part of the CI community and to lead the Santa Rosa Island Research stable, uh, Station as it stabilizes and expands into the future. It's really a neat place. He works in a really wonderful spot of the world. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Russ Bradley. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ken. I um, appreciate the introduction very much. Very happy to be able to talk to everyone today. Um, and yeah, I. We'll go ahead and share my screen, but I'll just say when I start uh, that I know that many of you uh, out there uh, may have known of the first director of the research station, Dr. Claus Hanna, who uh, passed away far too soon, a few years ago. And so I'm very honored to be in this position and we look to, to build on the great legacy that he created with this program. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully that's gonna work and let's see what we can do. Okay, so we're going to go in presentation mode. And we're going to come on here and see if this happens for us. Okay. All right, let's get it. I think I figured out how to do this. That looks Which good. Is, is, but is this just the... 
Oh yeah, we're seeing the preview slide. Uh, with the notes. Yeah. yeah, this should be the whole thing, right? Yep, you got it. We're good now. Excellent. So very happy to be talking to uh, all of you folks who are associated with fans of Channel Islands Restoration today. Again, uh, I am. We are with or, or our you know our research station is associated with California State University Channel Islands in Camarillo. And so, yeah, so we start with me. So thanks, Ken, for the introduction. Here I am, I'm out on uh, Soledad Beach, uh, part of our marine debris um, research and uh, removal project out there. But um, there was a bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, background, you know, sort of on my background. And I thought I, I might just, you know, relay a bit of that in some of the, uh, especially some things that particularly relate to plants. But I was definitely, as Ken mentioned, an ocean and island kid. and I start here. This is on Protection Island in the, in the harbor of a place called Nanaimo on the east coast of Vancouver Island. That's me on the far right. Uh, I was one of those kids that, and my brother and sister are probably very happy that I used this picture in presentations, but I was one, I saved my parents from in the ocean when I was six years old and I couldn't get out. Um, just feel really passionately about the opportunities that people have as kids, especially in getting connected with nature can be um, extremely important and extremely transformational. And that's kind of you know what it what 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 builds on, and uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, I had this really cool opportunity initially in high school. I had a high school biology teacher who got me in this program at a place called the Banfield Marine Station on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and I wound up doing a whole semester there, my senior year, it's marine biology semester. That's me on the bottom left hand corner. That's in 1993, a long time ago, but. Um, it's a reason why I stayed in science. We were just like 20 some of us students and we were out on the West Coast of Vancouver Island and we were doing this you know, incredible science and having a lot of fun and just you know, really having this experience as a university student in a, in a, uh, in a, in a field station setting that I throughout my whole career have you know, always, always thought back on and why I'm very happy to be in the position that I'm in now to be able to, to support that. Just a couple of things along my career path that kind of relate to plants. I had to spend five and a half months up at the Lisa and Atoll, which is 400 miles from Midway on the uh, Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And even though I was really passionate about the seabirds there and, you know, these reefs that have never been fished and a bunch of amazing wildlife, the reason that we were there and I was there as a volunteer of Fish and Wildlife Service was on a, uh, the very final stages of an eradication program for a synchro that in invasive sandbur that had caused some problems with native bunch grasses and a bunch of the native animals, but, you know, had a, had a pretty, pretty amazing, amazing opportunity to sort of be out there and spend a bunch of time on the on remote islands. As Ken mentioned, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an island person and, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about a lot of these places. Um, I wound up going back and to Canada and I did my master's degree on this large um, radio telemetry project on marble murrelets, which are these little seabirds that breed in the old growth forest. And this bird is the only one we ever, I ever saw on the nest with all these, you know, we tracked almost a hundred uh, radio mark birds to their nest sites, but this bird is actually in a deciduous tree. It's a red alder tree, which is very rare. It was not successful. It was a, it was a huge, huge amplified cover, but I think this was the first ever this species that ever been found in a, in a uh, deciduous tree. But a lot of that work involved working in these types of places. These are all areas where there are nest sites and birds, but old growth, uh, Pacific Northwest Forest, Citrus Spruce, uh, yeah, uh, Red Cedar, a lot of nests in uh, Douglas Fir, those sorts of places. And so um, that kind of really got me passionate about forest ecology and linked my, my, my background in, in marine with the forest. And then as Ken said, I spent uh, much of my career in, in on this place, spent over almost 1800 days here. This is Southeast Farallon Islands, the Farallon Islands National Wildlife Refuge, 30 miles west of San Francisco biggest uh, seabird colony in the contiguous United States. Very important area for uh, seal, a bunch of seal, sea lions and uh, white sharks and stuff and uh, unique islands, uh, um, you, you know, uh, not as many endemic, actually very, very few uh, endemic species, only one really of a, a, a cricket a insect, but um, very cool plant community. This is maritime gold fields in the spring in the front with the, with the yellow flowers, the uh, Lassinia meridomy. Uh, what I call Fairlawn weed, and two of the three islands trees there, um, the uh, the cypress. But this is a very special place involved in a lot of this long-term program. Um, I was I was an intern on Fairlawn in 1998, and when I went back as a biologist after my master's, 
I was basically involved in this program from year 33 to year 50. Uh, Point Blue Conservation Science, formerly PRBO, um, Point Reyes Motors Observatory, has had people on the Farallon Islands every day since April of 1968. So I was involved in this project from years sort of 33 to 50, and I was a biologist and I was program manager for a long time. And so when I left there to come here, I'm sort of drawing on that, that background and sort of being in this really long-term program that is not really you know, about any, any, any one individual and trying to bring that experience as we um, grow and expand and, 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 and stabilize this you know, amazing research uh, station program on Santa Rosa. So that's a little about me. Um, we are uh, you know, here to talk a bit about the, the research station and Channel Islands National Park. And we have a little bit about the park here up front. It's uh, you know, maybe general for folks, but uh, maybe not for others. There's that view of Santa Cruz that we have from Santa Rosa and it is spectacular. It is, I think, you know, there's very few coastline views uh, when you're looking along the coast of California for 50 miles and you can't see a man-made structure. So, uh, you know, the Channel Islands National Park encompasses the, the five islands and their natural and cultural resources. And we have this thing in students where we ask people to name the islands. And, you know, you're probably familiar with them of, you know, San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa that are the main islands in the park. But um, I always like to point out in, for students this, this outer outline, which is actually the original island when the sea level was different and all these islands were connected. Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa, and uh, it's fascinating to think about, you know, this huge connected system of island, or, you know, this one giant island, and, you know, we've got pygmy mammoths moving around, and uh, I, I, I maintain we could, we could, if we just had that outer outline, that is Santa Rosa on a pink t-shirt, Santa Rosa all day, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe five people you ever meet would be, <laughs> would, would get that joke, but um, it highlights the, the, the amazing, history and geography of this place. So the national park that we're here, a lot of you are familiar with it, but you know, often called the North American Galapagos, home to many endemics and you or you know unique species. Um, even though the Channel Islands are within you know 60 miles of 18 million people, these are you know some pretty uh, you know amazing undeveloped coastline. We've got unique species like you know the uh, island foxes. Uh, got some you know so I've, I've met some folks who told me that when they were in biology classes in the 1970s, they were told that blue whales were going to go extinct. And now the, you know, some of the biggest densities of blue whales in the world you find here in the Santa Barbara Channel. And, you know, just that alone is uh, an absolutely extraordinary thing for people to experience. And, and I've been lucky enough to, and, you know, some of our students stuff seeing that, I always remind them how, don't take this for granted. Like this, is, this is an incredible thing. There's, you know, more nature species exist in this park than in any other um, unit of the National Park Service. And, we, and we're really fortunate to have this great cooperative agreement and arrangement that um, we have with the Park Service to be able to have our research station. So our park is full of natural resources. This is you know, the things we do for education. We talk about what are those? Obviously, you know, we've got water and sand and all the plants and those materials. And when we go out to these islands, we see these amazing natural resources and they're incredibly important. It's also um, really important to remember that these uh, islands, are incredible, have incredible amount of human history and cultural resources. And that the Channel Islands have had continuous human occupation for over 13,000 years, and have had this, you know, really amazing history of indigenous people. And the, talking about later about, you know, some of the all, all the other different communities and parts of this very, very special place. There's, a, you know, a timeline from the parks website and some of the historical work and. Um, survey work that's documenting those. So I think even those of us who, who have a lot of experience and focus on the natural resources always have to put into context the amazing both history and present of the, the cultural piece of the park. And of course, all these you know, islands are surrounded by the, the uh, National Marine Sanctuary and you know, trying to, you know, working to protect and restore habitats and, uh, you know, provide reference areas for research and educational opportunities and, you know, protect our, our marine heritage and some of these, um, these protected areas that are associated with the park as someone who worked in, you know, another part of the state and where there, you know, these, these state, um, state marine protected areas that 
don't have as much of the you know enforcement and, and oversight it's it is very special that there are these true protected lean areas within the park and there's a lot of great work that the sanctuary is doing on multiple fronts and so we, we just have it you know talks about all these great marine resources you know obviously the dolphins and the seals and the whales and the you know we, we a lot of our students you know have met who, who who come to the island have never been on a boat before never seen dolphins before we've got a you know some adult male with an elephant seal here and someone who's worked a bunch on elephant seals it's you know the channel islands are this you know incredible mecca and those populations are just expanding and again we've got you know the large baleen whales a couple of just sort of fun facts about santa rosa we got here yeah again they sort of, of own subspecies of the island fox has some endemic plants and you know like this is the a part of the tory pines grove here which is uh you know showing some pretty um you know amazing expansion we've had some student research projects you know working working in there um you know there was there have been several pygmy mammoth skeleton uh, skeletons that have been found on santa rosa for some of the uh, less uh enthusiastic students i was like well what's special about santa rosa Island? so well, those two words for you pygmy mammoth imagine a woolly mammoth five feet tall eight feet long um you know these giant Colombian mammoths swam to the channel islands um and through time and through evolution became smaller and uh you know, turn into these these pretty extraordinary creatures. There's about thirteen thousand years of human history. We've got all the marine species, and there's so Santa Rosa. The the Shumash uh, name to describe Santa Rosa is 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 Wima, which um, you know can refer to driftwood, which is an incredibly important resource on the islands. And this is the second largest island off the coast of California, or second to Santa Cruz. So yeah, so there's 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 a bit about the park. So we are the um, Santa Rosa Island Research Station, and we are part of Cal State University Channel Islands campus. You know, the youngest and smallest of the CSUs. And so you know, we'll talk a little bit here about you know our our operations, you know what we do at the research station, and kind of you know where we see ourselves going um, moving forward. So what are we? We 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 really want to support natural and cultural resource research and education. Uh, we want to build an inquiry center to educational um, partnerships. We want to engage stakeholders, discovery and information dissemination. A big thing for us is really inspiring and transforming the participants and society. We do these reflections with our students and other you know, groups that we support, middle and high schools. And it blows my mind. We're, we're trying to figure out how to, how to, you know, we're doing this more quantitatively, but the amount of People, students who have these experiences in places like this who have never been camping before, never been hiking before, never seen the stars before. That's what blew me away, the amount of people I've never seen the Milky Way before. And this one, I've never been without cell phone reception before. And that um, can be a very transformative experience as well. Um, we wanna promote the stewardship of the resources and encourage broad sharing of interdisciplinary knowledge. The interdisciplinary piece is really important um, for our, for our station. Yes, we have a lot of work with environmental science, biology students, with, with anthropology, um, with those sorts of disciplines, but we support groups across the board um, from political science to Chicano, Chicano studies. Um, we've had groups in, you know, from nursing to arts, performing arts. We do a lot of using arts as outreach for some of our research projects. So we really see the value of, of having this station as a real you know, interdisciplinary community. Um, and so from a physical standpoint, under the cooperative agreement we have with the park now, we, we utilize the, the bunkhouse, which is adjacent to the pier, um, you know, part of the, the ranching and, and hunting history of the island, which we can, can uh, house, you know, 30, 36 individuals, and we have, you know, community kitchen and stuff, and, and we have lab facilities, field equipment, and, and the like. And so what do we do? We support, you know, education programs across all grades from middle school and high school. We do programs at the island. We support uh, undergraduate students. We have some, some graduate students. We'll talk a bit, a bit more later on here about some of these summer field studies programs that we're developing. And finally, I'm going to be implementing this summer, do a lot of student research. Our university um, has a real focus on 
student research capstone, what we call capstone projects. So these are the opportunities for students to get, um, you know, get, get, get experience while they're still there. Our, our university also has like, a, Kelsey Channel Islands is neat. Like we don't have things like sports, like organized sports. So like student, a lot of things for student fees go to student experiences so they can fund a lot of the, um, you know, expensive transportation and, 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 and fees associated with, with getting, getting folks out to the island. But we support faculty research, folks from other institutions, graduate students and, and undergrads and service organizations. Um, you know, basically things, are, you know, users that can meet the mission of the research station, there are, there, are, there are opportunities to be able to, to use the facilities. So teachers out there, folks who are, you know, working with specific community groups, I think that, that this, this might be an opportunity for you to feel free to reach out, reach out to me and discuss that. Um, this kind of captures some things. So there are 11 university run research stations in national parks in the United States of America. That's not that many. And our university, the youngest and smallest in the CSE system, has one of these unique relationships. And it, it, it's a very special thing. And between the when the station really started up to, you know, till 2020, at least we logged more than what 22,000 we call user days, which is, you know, one person on the island in a day. And that includes 26 of Cal State Channel Islands academic programs. 40 other institutions of higher education, nine, nine local schools, a bunch of state agencies, federal agencies, and many non-governmental non organizations. <laughs> um, and with the, we're a member of the Organization of Biological Field Stations and uh, uh, received their Human Diversity Award a few years, several years back. Um, so this is looking back down, down onto the onto the ranch area. Everybody's favorite little island fox. This one's a little sleepy. Um, the uh, <laughs> those let me tell you the for folks who are familiar with the the history of the island and the uh, sheep ranching history and these these two tanks. Um, there it makes a great segue to be able to uh, get students uh, excited about you know a, you know story or history. I tell them, does anyone like scary movies? Well, let me tell you about what these tanks were used for in the uh, history of the of the end of the sheep era on the island. There's a few pictures here showcasing the uh, students in action out at the research station. Uh, this is a particularly windy spring day. These are some environmental science students coming back down from Carrington over to the station. Largely, this is all pre-COVID, but yeah, we are. We're, we're, we're really trying to get um, a diverse group, group of students out there doing a variety of things. I talked about the, some of the astronomy and stars, and we actually got some um, equipment donated. And some of our, one of our, our physics professors and his students came out and helped, helped set this up that, that we can utilize in our, in our programming. Um, what kind of research do we do? A whole lot. Um, everything from marine debris, research and removal, to looking at long-term data. Uh, we have a study now that we're we working with students on monitoring these really unique uh, lagoon habitats around the east side of Santa Rosa. We work closely with USGS, the park, a bunch of other agencies, you know, uh, working, working in concert with some of the cultural resource folks, um, big tree demography, remotely operated vehicles, uh, you know, off the pier, um, many, many, many different opportunities. And what does research look like? And we say that it, it looks like everybody. So these are all some a variety of different um, of our capstone uh, research students working on things from microplastics to large large uh, large tree demography. Um, yeah, using the using new technology, remotely operated vehicles, uh, changes in the vegetation, and even on the right uh, there, Patty was a, a art art major. We had uh, art students who did uh, incredible capstone on the island that built you know, ceramic dinnerware that is used at the research station that is all model off island textures and colors and um, you know this cool sculpture project that was associated with that as well. Um, so you know we were this is kind of a you know a bit of a recap but uh, we've been spent the last few years that, that I've been here trying to really secure and build up the program we got to spring 2020 and we were really working on stabilizing the program for the well, last 18 months and obviously when we hit COVID or we were really prepared for some, some major 
major large scale use starting in spring 2020. And as is the same for everyone, there was pretty, pretty huge impacts to the COVID. And throughout this last period, we have um, our, our large scale overnight use definitely declined. We definitely took a hit on our user days and stuff in the, in the summer in 2020 there. But so we moved into 2021. Um, we did a lot with uh, things related to virtual content. There's a whole bunch. We we're part of this larger collaboration, virtual field across many different field stations um, that uh, we have these cool uh, ecosystem exploration videos where you can do a lot of, you know, their virtual lesson plans and stuff. And this is actually, um, this is a cool one that we did this, this virtual art exhibition, which was called Santa Rosa Island Gateway to Expression. And this, uh, one of our student interns who's still with us now, this is one of his pieces. This is called Sushi for the Grandkids. See that sushi up there? That's actually all marine debris. That's like packets that there's some, some foam, some strapping from lobster traps. There's a glue bottle in there and one of the rolls. And, and this is an example of how I think a lot of this, you know, interdisciplinary stuff, things like art can help um, do great outreach, uh, help to, you know, bridge a gap, do education about conservation issues and the like. So that's, that's just one example. Um, we support a lot of day trip use and small, small research group support. Um, and we're, we're hoping that, you know, well, obviously safety is our top, you know, priority and we're, we work very closely with our university's policies, but we really think that we, we're, we're hoping that we can expand our activities starting in, in, in late spring and summer and moving forward. Um, so it's like, uh, the current and future opportunities with the with the research station. You know, we work closely with the park, but we're doing curricular and applied research across all academic disciplines, including you know, coursework, capstone, internships, retreats, those sorts of things. And you know, we're building on our the interdisciplinary work that we're doing. We have this field studies program we're planning for the summer, and really helping to promote a lot of the work that we do is helping to promote diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, we want to create opportunities. I want to create opportunities for out for us for a lot of our students that that I've that I was uh, able to have that 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 they might not. And it's a very important thing for us. And being able to have our students and have younger folks have these experiences, um, which can really transform their lives. And so you know the fact that we are lucky enough to have partners like Island Packers that can you know. It's, it's a fair, logistic. people ask me, like, wow, there's so much logistics in moving people to the Channel Islands, which is absolutely true. But, you know, I spent 17 years working on the Fairlands where we were, you know, on a sailboat for five and a half hours, crashing straight into the wind and dropping small boats with cranes, you know, and, and having to do these very, very uh, difficult um, uh, operational stuff to get on the island. So the fact that there are, you know, there are great opportunities to get people who are a little less, less experienced and savvy out to these places is really, really important. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to contribute the, the see how the station can be the, can help recruit students, retain them, uh, prepare them for their uh, careers. As this talks about the CI brand, basically what our research station is, is we, you know, we, we put the Channel Islands in Cal State Channel Islands. So um, that's still, there's a constant education with that, with, you know, people who, who haven't been out to the Channel Islands or haven't been to the research station, but we see it's, you know, very exciting to be able to make these, these connections show what this value can be for our campus or students or community. And that, you know, doing programs at the research station help us to, you know, understand and address really important issues like climate change, sustainability and resilient and other, and other pressing issues. So we, you know, we, these are some students, some environmental science students marching back. And we hope that as we are moving forward with the research station uh, and this program, stabilizing it, growing it um, into the future, that uh, we will all be, you know, marching on an, uh, arm in arm. And hopefully, like these folks, uh, as we move forward with, with uh, safely with, with less restrictions. And so, you know, just thank everybody for being here. There's our, our Instagram on the bottom, which has a lot of great content. We sort of shout out to our social, our, our um, student engagement intern, Genoa, who I'm, I think is, is on this too. Um, there's great information about the station, about our programs, about opportunities there that you can check out and you can email me as well. But, you know, just want to let the community know that, you know, this, this, this program uh, exists and we're, we're very exciting in, in partnering with other folks. 
and just helping to spread the word about the you know amazing nature of Santa Rosa Island and the opportunities and programs out there. So I think that that is it for me in terms of the organized presentation. So thank you very, very much. All right, well, thank you, Russ, that's great. So we've got plenty of time for questions, folks. Uh, I have uh, just three right now. So if you wanna enter something into the Q&A, Maury, maybe you can take them now since I'm reading the ones that have already come in. Uh, but uh, plenty of time to ask Russ some questions. Uh, first off, I like this one. Did you meet Hugh Hauser when he did a show out on the Farallon Islands? See, did Kathy, I, meet, I, did, did I meet Hugh Hauser? Yeah, and I could talk for 30 minutes about my Hugh Hauser experience <laughs> on the Farallon <laughs> Islands. But no, absolutely. He was great. People who aren't familiar with Ewell Hauser, he's, he's unfortunately no longer with us, but he had a PBS show um, uh, called California's Gold, and he was very much interested in, in just bringing people all these, you know, amazing different parts of California. And the Farallon Islands was on his list for a while and worked with the, with the uh, uh, um, Fish and Wildlife Service to get on there. But yeah, I was, I was there. He wound up shooting two shows that day. And Hugh Hauser was his own producer. So he was like, we're, we're doing two of these things. And yeah, we were able to show him the Farallon Islands. It was a great experience. It was lots of fun. And I, uh, Ken sort of did his accent there. And there's, if you watch the second episode of that, when we're near, almost near the end and we're at the Mon one Monterey pine tree, I'm describing the Monterey pine tree on the Farallons. And I realized, Russ, you've got a Southern accent all of a sudden. Yep, yep, this is a pine tree, another tree right here. So Hugh was, he was very infectious, and, but he's, his, his demeanor and his joy for California and all of its amazing resources and, and people will, will, will always be missed. And so, yeah, I had, I had great fun spending some time with him a while ago. Yeah, well, Hugh was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was. Someone has made, there, there's a clip on YouTube that someone constructed of just all the times in the Fairlawn episode that Hugh Hauser said, wow, it's a close <laughs> for like two and a half minutes. So if there are Hugh Hauser fans out there, look up. Hugh Hauser, wow, Fairlawns, and, and you'll get something that, uh, that yeah. uh, will pique your fancy. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Okay. Um, on a slightly more serious topic, our board president chimed in, and uh, she pointed out that we entered into a partner agreement with CSU Channel Islands. So uh, that was in November of last year. And she wants to know if there's any programs already ongoing on Santa Rosa that we can piggyback on either for college or K through 12. Yeah, absolutely. I would say definitely reach out to me directly. And, um, you, you know, I, I think there are, there are lots of opportunities. The, the COVID, COVID definitely threw a, a huge monkey wrench into the challenge for us was, or, you know, because up until and including this point, organizing the sort of in-person activities, so much uncertainty that um, it's the, my whole thing is like the, the, the if I, I, I would say, if I get into a conversation where my answer to the first three questions, five questions that someone has is, I don't know, that's, that's not necessarily productive. So I think that there are lots of opportunities on that front, uh, particularly, you know, in the K-12 and other research stuff. And basically things are looking brighter now. So um, I think we can we can engage on a lot on, on a lot more of, of that stuff in a, in a way that that we know there should hopefully be less uncertainty. So I'm excited about that in the future. Please reach out to me. I'm happy to have those conversations. Great. Okay. And um, along those same lines, just in general, people yeah. are interested in uh, volunteer opportunities on the island. You know, a lot of people have gone out with CIR to the islands, but uh, are you uh, going to be offering uh, volunteer opportunities to the public? Or there, there, are, there are some. You can go ahead and come on our website. You can see occasionally those are uh, with some things like maintenance projects. There are we occasionally have volunteers to help things like with our uh, marine debris projects. People collect marine marine debris on the island. So yeah, if you if you come on our website, you'll see some different opportunities, and you'll see where you can you can uh, contact uh, appropriate folks. So not as much right now, but yes, we definitely foresee that going forward and in, in some of the you know partnerships with other projects that are happening in the park and such, so yes. Okay, great. And then I'd like to point out that CIR did our first uh, educational trip to Santa Rosa Island uh, in the fall 
uh, of last year, and we'll be doing another one uh, uh, this fall. So uh, we had botanist Steve Junak and a whole bunch of other uh, experts on geology and anthropology, uh, et cetera, and um, had a really great time uh, taking people out to the island. So that's a, a, a way to go out uh, for a day trip um, and be able to hang out with an expert who is talking about something that you might be particularly interested in. So got some more questions here. Um, yeah, are there any remaining feral horses left on the island? I believe the answer is no, correct? Yeah, that the answer is no. So I was fortunate in the time that I was there, there was still Sam and Bullet, the last two who were moved down from the Carrington area into the into the ranch, um, just to keep a better eye on them. And they were they were um, sort of really amazing to have that time with. But no, unfortunately, they both passed away during during COVID, and so that is you know the end of that um, that era. But um, yeah, really special animals, and very fortunate to be able to uh, to see them and be able to spend a bit of time with them. Okay, and uh, how, if at all, have you utilized uh, preparatory, uh, no, I'm sorry, participatory science to help research done on the islands? Are there any ongoing projects that people can participate in? So another- For uh, sure, term. sort of participatory science, citizen science, community science, those sorts of things. Um, we, have a, we have several projects that we do uh, that we have run with uh, school groups. And I'll mention one that is a lot of, um, we're working with some of the uh, faculty at, at, at our university. We have this series of photo points where basically we have people, you know, taking pictures in the same locations throughout time. And we use that for multiple things. There, there's some education stuff there, but it's also a great way to be able to track vegetation change throughout time. That is pretty, pretty standard and straightforward. So. Within our educational program, we have that and a, and a few other projects that um, we want our participants to be able to help, you know, collect, uh, collect long-term data. Great. Um, what kind of evidence of climate change are you seeing in the Channel Islands? <sighs> climate change in the Channel Islands? Well, there is, um, you know, I think there, there's, pro I'm probably not the best person to, uh, there's, there's so many different sources with this. But I think, um, you know, a lot of both in the Channel Islands and some of my other work on, on other California islands, you know, seeing change, you know, changes in, in temperature, um, of course, that, that was actually one with the Fairlands that we could, because there's very few things of like, you know, what is, you know, direct climate change. And on Fairlands, and I'm sure it's similar on the Channel Islands, we had temperature data that went back to the 70, uh, you know, 70s, and, and you really see it's for the you know overall highs and the amount of you know extreme events and actually there's one incredible one that is uh, i think an unbelievable example of ch of climate change in the channel islands and that relates to a seabird called a brown booby and also even a blue-footed booby which um there's a, a rock off of um santa barbara island called sutil um rock, rock where these birds which are tropical and have never bred in the United States, have for the last several years bred uh, and, and produced young in the, channel, in the Channel Islands. And to me, this is an incredible, you know, this is an incredible story that relates to climate change. The changes that we've seen, changing ocean conditions, changing you know, water temperatures um, and such have led to this tropical species moving north from these, these animals breeding, breeding Mexico and stuff. And they are breeding in the United States for the first time within our, our national park. And they're, you know, very charismatic, large seabirds. Um, but yeah, that, that to me is like, an, is, is some real strong uh, evidence in a, in, a, in, a, in a very, you know, charismatic megafauna way of, of the types of changes that climate change can bring, particularly to species distribution. Yeah, that's more, uh dramatic than what I was going to say, which is some of the smaller islands like Santa Barbara and Anacapa Island have really been hammered by um, uh, the lack of rain and yeah. also invasive species like crystalline ice plant have yeah. just uh, crowded out the 
the habitat in that plant, which is not native, of course, to California, does really well, uh, even if there's no rainfall, uh, whereas a lot of our native plants, you know, do need uh, the winter rain to, to survive. So um, it looks kind of like just from uh, various trips that I've been on uh, with uh, the Island Plant Collective group that uh, the smaller islands are uh, suffering first from climate change. Um, but that's interesting about the booby. Um, let me see, what do we got here? Um, what is the status of Channel Islands National Park Service's proposed proposal and RFE, RFP to put a visitor center facility at Betcher's Bay? <laughs> Good question. So basically the, the answer to that is that the park is in this larger portion of their general management plan that, that relates to you know, potential expansion development concession errors on the island. And so um, we are working very closely with them and the park is committed to you know, the, the research station's presence on the islands, but this is basically we're, yeah, I think you know, working closely with the park, this stuff is still in its, in its very, very early stages, but we, um, we really envision a role for you know, the uh, Santa Rosa Island Research Station to be, you know, to become something that that will be an important part for generations. And I think the park sees this long-term vision as well. There's specific stuff to be worked out in those different components, but um, we are working closely with them. And I encourage everyone who is interested in Santa Rosa Island, which is unique and very different than Santa Cruz Island, if they are interested about, you know, issues that relate to some of that stuff with potential concessionaires or the park's backcountry management plan, Go on the park's website. There's a lot of opportunities for public input, public comment, and those uh, there, those those sorts of things because um, you have real opportunities to to engage engage with the park on on some of these uh, potential questions. Yes. Hey, uh, Russ, I forgot to mention we we uh, did a webinar recently that you can find on our website about climate change, especially as it relates to the islands. So if people want to go to our um, Channel Islands Restoration website, which is CIR web, like webpage, .org slash webinars, you'll see um, more information on that. Um, what do we got here? So uh, yeah, this is a, a good question. I, I know the answer, but I'd like to hear yours. Is there a need for invasive species management in the plant communities of the islands? <laughs> Isn't that a capital Y E S exclamation point exclamation point? It's, yeah. You know, one of the one of the things about these islands is that they are, um, you know, they are amazing. They are extraordinary, and they are also have been accessed by a lot of people. And this, and I'll let Ken chime in here too. But the you know both the management of the existing invasive plants is is a huge issue, as is the issue of island biosecurity, the the, the potential transport of new plants and, and animals into these. A unique uh, habitats that have not uh, evolved to be able to, um, you know, uh, or, or sort of compete with other invasive species or, or predators and such. So yes, absolutely. As you know, you can jump in here too, Ken. But the the issue of invasive invasive plants in this park is cri is critical, and it it requires a lot of attention from. You know, there's a lot of great organizations like CR CR that are involved in that. But no, there there is no shortage of invasive plant issues on the Channel Islands, right? Can't keep you busy for another 200 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, in some cases, uh, we might lose uh, the battle with climate change and uh, species like crystalline ice plant that I mentioned a little while ago. Uh, one of the more interesting um, invasive species projects that happened on the islands was the eradication of uh, rats, black Black rats uh, from Anacapa Island. That was the first yeah. place they had ever been eradicated um, anywhere in the world. Yeah. And uh, it, it had an immediate effect on seabird nesting. Uh, the numbers uh, dramatically went up and uh, uh, with murrelets and I'm forgetting the other bird right now. Oh, well. But. Pretty much a Cass's Auklets returning Auklets. there. Yeah, no, it, it, the, I can actually speak a bit to that because I'm very involved 
for many years on um, a bunch of different research projects and the uh, environmental impact statement that's created for a proposed eradication of house mice from the Fairlawn Islands. And um, yeah, no, the, the, the Anna Kappa project has had a lot of success. They're, they're very, these, these projects are very unique and have a lot of you know, important issues in them, but there are a lot of amazing conservation um, success stories that can come from the you know, re uh, removal of some of these um, introduced species. And they, if you go outside of plants and the mammals, I think it's something that this park has done an incredible job of and seeing the like, uh, I think even the, the, the impacts and, and, and recovery of even something like Tory, like watching what, what's happening with the Tory pines on Santa Rosa and how they are, not only is that main grove healthy, like how it's expanding down the, down the plain and, uh, and really sort of seeing how some of these changes in invasive species or, or you know, and, and restoration efforts can have real ecosystem change. Even the, some of the shrub, the Toyon shrub habitats around our area, our current, you know, footprint in, in Betcher's Bay, I ask people, oh, well, how tall were these things, you know, like five, 10 years ago? And they're like, they weren't here. Um, so the, yeah, they're, they, we are seeing, uh, you know, ecosystem change occurring in these places and it's exciting it's exciting to be able to watch yeah um on santa rosa the um, previous island owners had introduced deer and elk for uh, trophy hunting purposes basically and i remember working out there and everything we needed to plant had to have a really good cage around it not just some chicken wire but serious posts and and uh fencing to keep them from being eaten after you put them in. And once uh, those animals were removed, uh, the population of the Torrey Pines just skyrocketed. And as you said, I'm, I'm sure plenty of other species. Um, and then um, on the other hand, you see Torrey Pines are the rarest pine in the world because there's two subspecies, one that just grows on Santa Rosa Island and another one that grows in Torrey Pine um, State Park, which is uh, north of San Diego. Those pines are not expanding. They're not doing as well. Climate change is probably affecting them in some people's opinions. But the Santa Rosa Grove, what, you've got over 100,000 now, right? Yeah, it, it, it is um, really expanded. And the one, um, there's a cool thing from the uh, student, last student project was done in like, they were, you know, 18, 18, 19, that looked at the seedling and sapling production, even compared to two years before. Now that was a really wet winter and, and who knows, cause the drought came in, how many of these survive? But the like, the, the, the like seedling production was basically a hundred times higher in like 18, 18, 19 than it had been, you know, a few years earlier. So um, yeah, there's, there's some pretty, pretty incredible recovery there. Hopefully these Plants can withstand drought and stuff. We had other students, uh, other students working on the bishop pines, which sound like they've taken a bit more of a. You can probably speak to this more, Cam, but like a, you know, a bit more of a of a of a punch from you know a few very you know insect issues. But the drought is is a is a is a big deal. But removing some of the some of those you know grazing pressures and various other things on those species is is really important for them. Yeah, I won't take our time now, but I could talk about how the pines disappeared on Pelican Trail in Santa Cruz. And, um, but then they're used to being burned and coming back. So who knows? So that's not talking forever. But uh, going back to climate change for just a second, um, Maury, my able assistant here, Maury uh, Spellman, uh, our marketing manager, reminded me that it, uh, our speaker was Dr. Uh, Patrick Gonzalez, who's the principal climate change scientist for the Park Service, the entire U.S. Park Service. So we had a chance to talk with him on a webinar. So check that out. This one's a, a little complicated. I think I know the answer, but let's take your get your take on it. You're the speaker. What uh, is the term of the agreement between Channel Islands National Park and Cal State Channel Islands? How often is it renewed? Uh, the Park Service is looking for concessionaire proposals. Do you expect to be displaced from the facilities by a concessionaire? Yeah, so this this relates to some of that previous um, you know discussion that we're we're in in, in close you know uh, 
sort of conversations with the park on this issue and that we have a, a commitment to the park that they, they are committed to the university and they are committed to the, you know, what the research station can bring, how that, you know, manifests in terms of specific use of buildings and stuff is still, um, you know, are and, and, and how that relates to, to very long, long-term planning are still things that are being sorted out. But in terms of our agreement, we currently have a 10-year agreement with the, it's called 10-year cooperative agreement with the park service that we're in the fourth year of and we have six years remaining on. Um, and so, yeah, we, we um, whether it's that or some sort of, you know, in terms of the longer term, uh, developing long-term lease agreements, to me, it's as someone, again, who's come from these very long-term projects, I think that um, it's critical to, to be able to set these things up, to build on the legacy that came before you, do the best while, while, while you're in it, and set that up uh, in the future. So no, I don't, I'm not fearful of us being displaced. I think there are, you know, a lot of elements in this plan that, um, you know, we are sort of working out with the, with, with the Park Service, but I think they see the valuable role that the research station can have and that can, that, that this, this type of thing on, um, on Santa Rosa as the, you know, UC station uh, has on Santa Cruz can really, you know, be something that can, can serve students and our community for decades to come. So that's what we're hoping for. Yeah, the, the work uh, in research that you've already started at that station is very valuable. It's invaluable to Channel Islands National Park. So, yeah, for uh, sure. The research and also I think just like the education and the exposure and, the, and creating opportunities for, you know, to just, you know, increase the opportunities for, for, for everybody to have more um, involvement in the, in their, in their public lands. And the fact that, you know, for us, the, the day trips are great too. They can be really transformative, but like you get people out there for, you know, a few days or the opportunity to research over, you know, multiple efforts. Um, it can, it can make all the difference, which is why I'm really excited about some of the intensive summer programs that we're developing as well for our students. Okay, and uh, a little more basic question, and um, that is, uh, can you chat a little bit about the camping on Santa Rosa Island? For sure, yeah. So there is the as it currently stands, there there are you know proposals for you know some expanded uh, campground around the pier, but the, there is the Water Canyon campsite, which is about a mile uh, walk from the from the pier. So that's a big thing. Is that at least right now there isn't a campsite right beside the pier. But um, it's a pretty special spot. Um, and for folks who like camping that is not, um, you know, as dense or it's, it's a far cry from Scorpion, which is a beautiful place too. But uh, um, that, that is a great hub that has, you know, water facilities <coughs> on Santa Rosa. And what seems to be becoming much more popular or, or sorry, not more popular, but just like that, that a, there's a lot of increased interest is at certain periods of the year, when there aren't you know, restrictions due to snow plovers or or elephant seals, that there are uh, people in the in the backcountry camping on beaches in certain areas at, at certain times of the year, and that is another thing that the park is looking into in its general management plan. And I encourage anyone who's interested in the issues related to to, to backcountry on a place like Santa Rosa, whether it should be expanded, whether it should have concessionaires involved or more resources. That's another thing you can go on the parks, Channel Islands Park web, website. They're starting into that process as well. And there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for, for, for public input there. But yeah, basically at certain periods of the year in the fall and such, you can also get out to some of these more um, remote spots on Santa Rosa and do beach camping. Um, the reality with Santa Rosa is that it is a large island and there are very few resources. So it is, if you, if you like that, if you want sort of wild and rugged, uh, Santa Rosa is for you. Um, if you want a huge amenities and a massive amount of people, that's not necessarily uh, <laughs> what we got going on, but it's a beautiful place to camp. I've spent time with friends at the campground too. And um, if, you, if you really like hiking and getting out into some of these remote areas, it is it's staggeringly beautiful. So I, I encourage uh, you to get out there. <laughs> I did a, a multiple um, presentations on recreational opportunities on the Channel Islands for REI for a long time. And um, I uh, always uh, recommended Anacapa and, uh, for a day trip, uh, especially in spring, and then uh, Santa Cruz, uh, East Santa Cruz particularly, um, well, it's all East Santa Cruz, uh, for camping or day trip at Scorpion Valley or uh, a more rugged country 
every sort of experience is going to the Del Norte campground on uh, the Isthmus of Santa Cruz, the eastern side. But um, Santa Rosa would then be my suggestion for the next step up. You better be prepared for wind. It yes. uh, really blows out there. And oh. right now, uh, Water Canyon is, uh, you know, a bit of a hike with all your stuff. The campground is, as he, as Russ said, is a mile away. So, um, but the park is uh, considering uh, putting in a campground near the pier. But yeah, that's one of the really unique things about Santa Rosa Island is, and, and this is taken advantage a lot by kayakers, is that you can, um, as he said, on certain times of the year, um, just go off into the backcountry of the island and set up a camp. Uh, and uh, in the past, I remember inquiring about it. I've never actually done that. I, I've driven everywhere that I've gone on the island, so I had it real easy. But in the past, you know, the, uh, people would go to um, some of the springs and bring water filters with them so that they could have drinking water. But, you know, it's a huge place. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, this yeah. is for all yeah. experienced folks. Yeah, water, wa water is really uh, the, the limiting factor. And I will advertise that we have our own speaker series that's part of the um, our, our student committee for Santa Rosa Island Research Station. If you go on our website for our, you know, um, which I didn't have here, I saw Jen will put it in the chat, but you can find our YouTube channel as well. And our, our we had a great talk from Tony Snap from the Botanical Garden today, but our previous speaker, Matt Grant, is someone who has spent a lot of time in the backcountry and circumnavigated Santa Rosa on foot. And he's got a great presentation in there about everything involved in that. I would echo Ken's thing that the biggest thing about doing a whole bunch of stuff in the backcountry in Santa Rosa is water. Yes, there are some persistent water streams. They, they are few and far between. And, and water management is the real key thing, I think, that you know, limits or, or is just um, something you really need to be mindful of in terms of you know, really getting out there on Santa Rosa. Yeah, and then somebody wants to know if there's family opportunities for tours. Um, right now on the, the Channel Islands, your best bet for a family um, trip would be to either Anacapa for the day or Scorpion on Santa Cruz Island for the day or camping uh, at, at uh, Santa Cruz. The, the walk isn't too far to the campground uh, and there's water there. Um, but uh, there are big plans for Santa Rosa possibly, uh, or there are big plans and we'll see if they all are implemented, Russ, but do you want to talk about family tours because they're our plans for tours actually in a concessionaire. Yeah, that, that's if you look in the general management plan and that, that is some of the sort of potential proposals about involving concessionaires. And that's something, again, if you're interested in or, or opposed to that uh, you can sort of get involved uh, in that. But that is, um, there's some things with uh, the parks considering under its, like the backcountry management plan where they might have either transportation or additional water sources, you know, for people that would, you know, allow folks to, you know, be able to get further afield. Something that's really important to remember in some of these spots is, is again, the like, uh, you know, the, the resource management part of this, the cult, the, both the, the sensitive cultural sites and, um, you know, some of the natural resources based on my own background and some surveys that I've done as someone who's worked a lot of time with seals and sea lions, pinnipeds, particularly out northern elephant seals. Um, Santa Rosa is actually, that's the third biggest elephant seal colony in California on the, the south side, which is expanding around, you know, the east point and such. And so there, there, are, there are a lot of, you know, amazing natural resources in some of these places that have had very few people for a long time. And those are important issues that need to be considered in these, you know, management decisions too. As far as families go, I think it, you know, I, all, all families are different. I've seen a lot of families come out either for day trips or three days on Santa Rosa and have a great time too. I think um, there are some uh, in the summertime or, or in during the, the main camping season, there are guided hikes by the uh, interpretive rangers um, and such. On, on Santa Rosa, it's, there's just definitely less, there, there, there's less of that than, than on the other islands. And it's a little more, you know, it's kind of more, more miles and such. But, uh, the, you know, that's kind of where, 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 where we're at right now is Santa Rosa is definitely a little more, is definitely wilder than the other than the other islands. Maybe not quite San Miguel, where you're surf landing in Zodiac, but um, but it is it 
I, I think there are there's great opportunities for family experiences there, but you need to be mindful that it is, you know, it, that that that's I think for the little more you know savvy savvy family that's up for hiking and hauling more gear, as Ken mentioned. Okay, we're um, getting uh, to the end of our hour here. Um, Maury says we'll put that link uh, to the website you just mentioned, Russ, into the chat. Sure. Yeah. For great. Thank you. And then this one, I don't totally understand. I don't know where this is. So uh, it's, I guess it's out at Sandy Point, but do you have any, uh, do you know of any research being done on the precipitous loss of kelp at uh, Talcott Shoals to Sandy Point? I, I, I don't think I can answer this because the, uh, I don't, Talcott Shoals, I, I'm not familiar with that. I'm familiar with Sandy Point. We have some sites where we do ring ring removal there, and there's some, you know, there's some seaward sites that are out there. But I know that in general, there is a, a large, there has been a bunch of loss of kelp in the Channel Islands, and that, uh, you know, that, that it's such an important uh, part of those uh, ecosystems. But I can't really, I think the folks that do the kelp forest monitoring, um, Within the park would be able to answer that uh, better. I think I, I think I see this question here. Is the terrestrial food web being affected by the lack of rack on the beaches? Can't answer that for sure. I can say that kelp rack provides a lot of um, you know uh, prey, uh, you know invertebrate prey, particularly for things like like snowy plovers, which are you know uh, some some of these last undeveloped areas of coastal dune California, be it Vandenberg Air Force Base or a place like Skunk Point out on Santa Rosa, are tremendously important for species like snow plovers. And the, yeah, the persistence of kelp definitely helps with 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 prey there. So yeah, I can't really answer specifically to that region, but there's definitely been a, a decline of of kelp in a lot of areas in the Islands. Okay, and and we can't get by without asking this, but are, do you have a wish list for donated items for the station? Well, yeah, there's um obviously, I think uh, you know, big big picture, and, and we are, we are lucky with our you know, we have uh, we we do have support, particularly from some donors who are very you know interested in creating access opportunities for students and people. So the you know that you know providing a boat fares, but in terms of specific uh specific items for the research station there's well <laughs> can i can i have your phone number so i can call you when something breaks <laughs> that to me is the biggest uh and 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 why it's important that these projects develop uh long-term stable funding which is when you know certain things like well we need to replace our utv so well that's gonna be twenty thousand dollars and and so like i think um uh I, as I'm such a long-term uh, field field camp program, I'm always an advocate for you know general general donations that can um, uh, that can be used for for you know different different stuff. Uh, there's you know gear stuff like like uh, like certain things with uh, outdoor gear. Sometimes like sleeping bags and stuff. There's some like st uh, students who who don't have these, um, and that like being able to provide that. We have a few extras of those. And, some some donations along along that line um, would be great. That's just that's just one idea, but uh, um, yeah, that's all, all I can think of right now. But I can come up with a big list for you. It'd probably be too big, but uh, I appreciate people's you know understanding that with all these kind of facilities, we're always looking for for donations and for help to keep all this running. Yeah, you know the questions keep coming in, and we're going to have to wrap this up uh, pretty soon. Uh, but I uh, do you have time for one or two more? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Um, by the way, just for anyone who wants to talk about donations to the station, uh, Russell's uh, uh, email address is on the screen. So be sure to get a hold of <laughs> Absolutely. But, um, uh, Helene Finger, hi, Helene, uh, asks, uh, are there any other CSUs involved uh, with research projects on the island? Yes. Yeah, uh, so, um, it is something basically that are, uh, as of right now, basically currently not that much, but we are very, we're involved in a couple of things. Uh, what we are working with a, a bunch of other field stations with, see, there are many different field stations and reserves within the CSU system, 
but we don't have the same level of coordination that exists for the UC National Reserve System. So we actually are trying to get this, what's called an NSF in, um, incubator grant to create this field station network across the CSUs. And, and there, there's a lot of interest from some individual professors. I've, I think now post COVID, there, there's a few from, from, from some of the other um, uh, ones that are you know, interested in being able to come out and, and do programs. I will say that we have, um, we've worked closely with, uh, as part of this uh, virtual field collaboration with some of the folks at uh, Sonoma State, and we actually did a really cool program, um, which is on our, I think it's, it's linked in through our YouTube channel, um, on art at field stations. And we were one of the field stations that participated along with one in Florida and one in the, in the Northeast. Um, but that was all facilitated by Sonoma State, and we 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 work very very closely with them on a lot of the education stuff. So the short answer is to be um, you know more coming more coming down the pipe. We want to see more collaborations, and also we recognize that within our area, there's you know um, we I think we can do a lot more with your CSU LAs and Dominguez Hills and 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 and, and Northridge and folks. So yeah, we are we're we're trying to to increase those opportunities. Okay, um, I think I'm going to have to skip on the, the questions about the management plan uh, um, <laughs> uh, right now. Um, the, there, uh, uh, Jamie Matera wants to know, can you talk a little bit about the uh, speaker series that you've mentioned? Who are the presenters? Sounds like sure. it was. Sure, yeah. So if you, if you come on our... Um... If if you if you go to our so if you if you go if you're an Instagram person and you subscribe to that um, our our handle there they're 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 advertised there but basically what this is is we are developing and it, it's it's virtual right now but it, it'll, it'll go back to in person but these are it's a series of speakers it's it's organized by our our student student committee and we bring speakers who are you know related to the Channel Islands to coastal issues across many disciplines to come talk to our talk to our students and so there's there's some information here like these series but there's we also ask speakers to talk a lot about their own career path their journey the kind of decisions choices they made how they wound up where they're at and to create re great resources for our uh, students and if you go on our our website there you'll get connected to our youtube page we record all these we have them on there so we have um we've had uh you know a, um Rangers from the Marine unit of the park. We've had multiple professors. We've had students and alumni, um, artists and scientists and hikers and um, you name it. And today we just had uh, Denise Snap from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, who's director of the, of the conservation department there. Talked a lot about that program, but talked about how she began her career as a fashion photographer too, which I had no clue about. And, and yeah, so a lot of it is, I think, targeted at students and they and you know sort of seeing seeing people's um different paths different journeys different kind of lessons learned so um we we want to keep these going through the school year and and again they're we're always advertised on our on our social media there and yeah um, it, they are currently we have a few more dates they are all at 5 30 on sort of every second thursday and the calendar if you if you if you go on our, our social media there you will see the calendar and all the links. Um, so thank you for, for uh, I think it was Jaime Matera, who's one of our professors, uh, helping promote that speaker series, so. Okay, the last two questions, I'm gonna just put them together, they're on different subjects. Uh, have there been any prehistoric plant specimens discovered near the mammoth bones? Not that I know of, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I, I can't, I, I, I can't we really. Had any, have we had any poaching problems? on the Channel Islands, especially of Dudleya, which is a succulent that uh, is, uh, has been poached a lot in the mainland. Yeah, so that's a very, that's a very important issue, the, the Dudleya poaching that I was really unaware of until I came down here and realized how much of a big issue this is in California and in, in the islands of Mexico and in, 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 in a bunch of different spots. I, it's something that is on the radar screen of the park uh, and their law enforcement. I think there are, there aren't really examples of, of widespread um, poaching on the islands, but I also think there is recognition that there is a major risk of that. And so, so yeah, this is this is a, this is an important issue that we need to you know continue to 
devote uh, you know attention to and continue monitoring of and and I hope if you know if there was any, any hint of that that there would be strong efforts with the enforcement because these plants these these deadly these amazing ancient um, yeah, succulents are uh, you know there's many endemic species there are incredible resources on the Channel Islands and, and we, we want to we want them to continue to be protected so we don't want to see any of that. Great. Um, we'll leave it at that. But Maury, if you can switch on your camera for a moment and remind folks uh, what we have coming up uh, in the webinar series. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Denise uh, Knapp, uh, Russell. Uh, she was one of our uh, first um, presenters. Uh, but I don't see Maury yet. <laughs> so I'll have to do it from memory. I know that we're going to have Matt. Oh, there you are. Go ahead. Yes. Matt Gilliams, was, I, I was going to mention, who's been with us before, but we're scheduling him for a return. Uh, yeah, next month we have uh, Dirk Charlie from the U.S. Forest Service. He's going to be talking about uh, fire and restoration. And what else? What else do we have? Let's see here. He's looking. <laughs> uh, he, he's the guy who set all these up, but it's hard to keep it in mind. You know? Yeah, um, April, we have um, someone who Russ may know, Jennifer Perry, um, who's an anthropologist at CSU Channel Islands. Um, uh, she, I believe she's a professor. She'll be talking about anthropology on the Channel Islands. Yeah, and she, she was she, on our... Go ahead, Russ. She was on, yeah, I, I think she was on one of your previous trips. Jen Perry has worked on the Channel Islands uh, since she was 18 years old. And she is also, she's actually my boss because now her current role is she is an uh, administrator. She is part of this uh, administrative unit um, about high impact practices at the university. So as someone in my position, it is fantastic to have someone above them who has all this experience on the Channel Islands and understands the value of the research station and such. But she is incredibly knowledgeable about the anthropology in the history of, of, the, of, of the island. I highly recommend people um, check out that presentation. Great. Great. Anyone else you want to mention? Matt Gilliams is going to be talking about the uh, flora of the eight Channel Islands, right? Um, or, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, Matt will be talking about his, the flora of the Channel Islands in his upcoming book. Uh, that'll be later in the summer. So we can look forward to uh, Matt's return to the webinar series then. Well. Yeah, so that'll be interesting. Um, there have been individual books describing the flora, the plants of various islands. Um, one is going to come out uh, from the Botanic Garden uh, uh, regarding C Catalina soon. Um, and then uh, soon after that, as I understand, the timing will be um, an all eight flora of the Channel Islands which is pretty amazing. Um, there are so many endemic, i.e. unique species that grow uh, on the Channel Islands as far as plants go, and not to mention animal species and things like that. Uh, so that'll be really interesting to us because we're plant nuts. And so are a lot of people who are watching this. But All right, well, thank you very much, Russell. We really appreciate your uh, presentation and Everyone who attended, um, uh, we had about 90 people, I think, at one point. So that was a, a good turnout. And um, thanks, Russell, very much hey, for your thank presentation. You. Thank, thank you very much, Ken and Moran. Thank you, everyone who, who attended and, and, and all the great questions and all your interest in the, in the research station. So thanks so much for your time. OK, join thanks. us uh, for our next one, uh, which is when, Maury? <laughs> Uh, it should be March 31st, the last okay. day of March, yeah. So next month, we'll be doing them um, uh, monthly for a while here anyway, probably until we get to the holidays. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, uh, have a good evening and um, thank you for all the thank yous I'm seeing in the chat and the, and the question and answer. Have a good evening.